But I mean, you want me to operate my own slides? Yes, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So welcome everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. So this is the second lecture in the Pont University Fall School. And today we are pleased to have uh, Sarah Biller from Vantage Ventures and also from the FinTech Sandbox and also D. Dushan Sharawat. Uh, who is uh, an investment banker at Rosenblatt Securities. And uh, we have chosen today, uh, which is going to be the first day of the next four years, I guess. Uh, and we wanted to see how we're going to be looking at fintech and especially with post-COVID scenarios and how things are going to go between now and the next few years with investment opportunities, the possible opportunities for startups, the opportunities for large corporations to think about the payment landscape, blockchain, looking at investment technologies, looking at cybersecurity and other means, and also how does the whole ecosystem change over the next few years. So what I'm going to do now is briefly tell a little bit about you know, what we have been doing in the Point University Summer School and the Fall School, and I'm going to pass the baton on to Dee. Uh, so let me share my screen. So this is uh, the fall school. So we actually are running three courses. One is a data science course, primarily for people who are interested in learning Python and uh, implementing data science applications. The second one is called as an AI machine learning course for financial professionals. And the third one is a model risk and a governance class. So all these three courses are offered in partnership with Premier. And this time we are also offering a FinTech bootcamp. We call it the eight facets of FinTech. So this program was conceived a few years ago when I was teaching a course uh, on the same topic, but uh, this course has become an elective at Northeastern University where I teach in the business school, primarily in spring. Uh, but we have also done uh, mini versions of this uh, at uh, the Boston FinTech Week last year uh, in fall. And uh, Dee was gracious enough to present his research at the Boston FinTech Week last year. And he's gonna pro provide a mini, mini version of it today, I guess, uh, in today's session. And uh, it's always a pleasure to kind of, you know, look at what's actually happening in the world. And we have uh, invited speakers from different disciplines. And we had a class on uh, synthetic data generation by Gautier Marty last week. And this week, we're going to have a course up on uh, FinTech in the post-COVID age. Next week, we're going to have uh, Dan Libu from uh, Lightbulb Capital. He has written a book on called the AI book, and he's based in Singapore. And he's gonna be presenting a talk on the ethical use of AI in financial markets. And uh, from there, Steven Jansen, who is the author of the book, Algorithmic Trading, will be doing a talk on synthetic data generation and finance. And then we have a talk on alternative data and uh, the API jungle. And a good friend of mine, um, Jakob Weinstock, who was the CTO at Arden and uh, also another uh, uh, large asset management company in New York. So he's gonna be joining us. And we are also bringing in a couple more speakers on this topic. And then week six, uh, we just uh, had a brief discussion yesterday with Valeria uh, Sotovic from um, PwC, Reed Blackman from Virtue Consultants and Jun Wu, who's a Forbes reporter on various technologies. So we're gonna have a discussion on responsible AI in action. So we have a packed agenda for the next few weeks. So if you're interested in learning more about uh, the fall school and also the lectures in the fall school, please register at qfallschool.splashthat.com and we will be sending you more information. So without further ado, I'd like you to um, join in for the next 45 minutes to an hour to hear about what does FinTech mean in the post COVID age? A brief introduction to our uh, eminent speakers, uh, D is a director in uh, Rosenblatt's FinTech investment banking practice on Wall Street. His group provides leading FinTech strategic advice, pursue m and and raise funds for VCs, PEs, and other institutional investors. Uh, he has 20 plus year track record at various financial institutions, and uh, he has written tons and tons of reports. I love reading your research, Lee. I've uh, been reading it for the past 20 years now. Uh, he's also a fellow Northeastern alum and also uh, gives a lot of time to educational classes and I do appreciate he joining us in, um, uh, in today's session. Uh, the one thing uh, is he's also a CFA charter holder uh, since 2007 and he also does a lot of uh, 
presentations for the CFA Institute at various chapters. And uh, uh, another good friend of mine, Sarah Biller. Uh, Sarah and I, we have known each other for close to a decade now. Um, uh, she is one of the, uh, the most um, kindest person I've known in terms of giving her time, his, her, her advice, and also making time for building the community. And her uh, you know, approach to bringing the community together has resulted in one of the, the forefront in terms of the FinTech areas, which is the FinTech Sandbox. And she has given her time and effort in just bringing all the ecosystem players, uh, the investors, the, the large corporations, and helping small startups to basically get connected with all these other organizations in terms of making sure that whatever they have been building are actually scalable and usable in enterprise. And uh, uh, beyond that, she has, I don't know where she finds this uh, time, but she gave away her secret early on to saying she's not sleeping and she did not sleep at all last night. Uh, so she uh, does a lot of education with uh, Brandeis and Boston New College and MIT. And she was also at State Street leading innovation ventures there. And she's also right now working with Vantage Ventures. And I'd love to hear more about your Hyperloop project and how you've been able to bring it uh, into fruition. Um, and uh, anytime I have a conversation with Sarah, I learn so much more. And uh, thank you so much for graciously presenting at today's event, Sarah. Um, without further ado, I will hand over the stage to Dee. And uh, Dee, uh, I think you should be able to share your screen now. If you're not able to, I will be able to uh, try and help you. But um, would you be able to try sharing your screen? Sure, sure. Actually, it says that uh, you, it says the host is disabled sharing so try that again Let's see if i can um okay so could you could you try now please sure how's that perfect so we can see your screen now great let me just switch it to full mode terrific well uh thanks Sri and uh sarah what, what a pleasure to be back on the air with both of you and um particularly in these kind of unprecedented times. So um, since uh, we've been all busy with a event over the last 24 hours, why don't we talk about that first? And uh, of course, anything that I say, I may have to change completely in 48 hours. Uh, so, you know, nothing that I do or say can be used against me in a court of law. Uh, but, you know, if you just look at the framework of what the implication of the election might be, whether it's another four years of the Trump administration or a switch uh, to to, a, to the Biden administration, there are a couple of factors that, you know, we sort of are universal. So the first set of factors are what the indirect implications of the election might be on the fintech landscape. And I won't spend more than two minutes on this. We'll spend about five, seven minutes on the next slide, which are direct implications for the fintech marketplace. So the indirect implications are obviously quite macro and you know, structural. So what happens to fiscal and monetary policy? Uh, point number two, very, very important is what happens to globalization and cross-border trade issues? Where does the US-China you know, dispute go? Uh, which might be if there's a Trump, Trump administration in the next four years, we would expect more of the same. But if there's a switch in the administration, then obviously US-China uh, issues might uh, be, you know, might have a different trajectory than we've had in the last four years with implications downstream to obviously financial services in the fintech landscape. Uh, point number three in the big tech space, we've all very keenly been watching what's what's happening with uh, more supervision and uh, you know, regulatory scrutiny on the big tech uh, companies, particularly obviously the DOJ's uh, lawsuit against Google filed last week, uh, absolutely bombshell event in the market. Uh, I thought it was quite ironic that the day that the DOJ filed the lawsuit against Google, the Google stock went up 4%. I mean, you know, figure that one out. Um, and then, uh, you know, what might happen for diversity and, you know, financial inclusion and privacy data protection. On diversity and financial inclusion last week, the FDIC, uh, you may have you may have seen or in case you missed it, uh, disclosed uh, numbers on the last available numbers for the percentage of U.S. households that are still unbanked, which means they don't have access to a bank account. And it was uh, terrific to see that at the end of 2019, which is the most recent numbers FDIC released, was the lowest that the percentage of U.S. households were unbanked. It was like more like about 5.5%, down from about 8% uh, 
um, in about 2017. So that's terrific. Like great news that we are almost at a all time low for the access to banking to, to American households. That's, that's tremendous. So these are the broad set of factors to look at when it comes to sort of big picture implications for of the election on, on financial services and in FinTech. If you look at, um, and, and please apologize, I apologize for the eye chart here. Don't, don't bother reading the whole thing. You've got access to these slides, but five areas that we are looking at in terms of direct implications in the FinTech landscape, if there is a switch in the White House or the change in the Senate. Um, again, prefacing my comments by saying that much of this is gonna be a change if there's a change in the White House. If the Trump administration has the mandate for another four years, we'd expect not a lot of these things to change all that much. Um, so these are really focused around if there's a change in government, then here are the five areas we're looking at. So the number one area is the m &A climate for large banks, which has been, um, you know, quite favorable in the last couple of years. We had record m and activity in 2018-19, particularly in the large uh, financial institution space. We had three massive deals in the payment space, you might remember last year, uh, big consolidation for entrenched players uh, in, that, in that space, like WorldPay and, and Fiserv and a bunch of players in that space. Um, so major m and activity in 2018 and 19. 2020, Q1 and Q2 were abysmal for M&A. Uh, nothing to do with the government policy. It was more to do with the COVID situation. Um, and we think that if there was a switch administration to a Biden administration, uh, usually a Democratic you know, administration tends to be a lot more tougher for things like um, you know, anti antitrust deals. So we expect that if there's a change in the White House, then there'd be a tougher climate and environment and more scrutiny by the DOJ, by the Department of Justice, on large institutional M&A uh, transactions. That would essentially mean that big banks might switch strategy and be more willing to acquire fintechs. Uh, so that be net net might be actually good for, for the fintech space for you know, privately held venture capital backed fintech companies. The second thing is that the Biden financial plan, if you read that, one of the big things they've proposed is, and there are not a lot of details available, but they have proposed the creation of a new public credit reporting agency. Um, that would be quite quite major in the in the lending space, and that would be a new agency that would compete with Equifax, TransUnion, Experian. The implication for the fintech space is, on the one hand, it might kind of further, further weaken the lock that the traditional credit bureaus have had on lending in the U.S. Uh, but on the flip side, uh, you know, the new credit reporting agency may actually embrace some of the more innovative concepts that a lot of the you know, digital fintech companies have been doing in terms of bringing alternative criteria to bear on making, you know, lending decisions. So to the extent that that new public credit reporting agency starting from scratch might actually embrace some of the innovative concepts and approaches and alternative data that the fintech companies have, that might actually net net end up being negative for, you know, privately held fintech companies, uh, which till now have been proposing that, you know, go with our alternative lending metrics because we have significant improvement over the traditional FICO based lending practices followed by the traditional credit bureaus. Uh, third is around fair lending regulations. So the Trump administration rolled back a lot of accommodated, accommodated policies towards fair lending over the last you know, couple of years. And uh, without offering any kind of political opinion one way or the other around that, that's what the administration did. And we think that if uh, there's a switch in the administration, the democratic administration, then uh, we would have a lot of those fair lending restrictions of traditional banks be reimposed. And that would, to some extent, reduce the you know, attractiveness of alternative digital lenders have, who have filled in the gap left by the large institutions as they have withdrawn from providing a lending ability, particularly to minorities and lower income households. Fourth is on the financial advisory space. You might remember that last year, the regulation best interest got passed. And the, the long story on regulation best interest, which actually governs uh, the restrictions and regulations and the supervisory environment under which financial advisors operate. The long story there was that Obama administration in 2009 um, had proposed something called the fiduciary standard which would basically have imposed much more stricter requirements on financial advisors when they are offering advice, you know, wealth management, uh, you know, which stocks to buy, what your portfolio allocations might be, 
So imposing greater amount of requirements, fiduciary requirements on retail financial advisors. That was the original plan, the fiduciary standard proposed in 2009-10. When it actually got passed, it was a much watered down version of it. Uh, and then it got stuck in, um, in, uh, in the usual sort of political rigmarole. Finally, where it happened, where it came out was a, a much more watered down version was passed by the Trump administration called regulation best interest. And uh, the impact in the fintech space was, is going to be, a, we think that if there's a switch in administration, then uh, we might actually have, a, you know, go back to maybe the old fiduciary standards. So more restrictive regulations on financial advisors. And, uh, you know, that we think could be a shot in the arm for robo advisors and digital wealth managers who have marketed themselves as an alternative to the traditional human based financial advisor model. And last is in the cryptocurrency space, um, despite the fact that the SEC, the Federal Reserve, the OCC, all the different regulatory bodies, and obviously the two houses uh, of government have passed some laws and there's some more clarity around cryptocurrency regulation. By and large, our view is the Trump administration has been quite kind of last of a hands off in regulating cryptocurrency. That to some extent has you know, fostered innovation in the cryptocurrency space, uh, but I think it's also slowed down institutional adoption of, of cryptocurrencies where institutional investors have felt a little bit uh, held back by a lack of clarity of rules and adequate supervision. If a Biden administration comes on, then there is some indication that some of the cabinet picks that the Biden administration has proposed might be taking a more active and aggressive posture towards cryptocurrency regulation. And that I think over long term would be good for the cryptocurrency market because it would be a more positive environment for big institutions to actually come in and make meaningful allocations to the cryptocurrency space. So those are kind of five areas where we think there could be direct implications of the election on FinTech. The sixth one uh, that I don't have here is uh, or any kind of impact of a switch in administration on open banking, which is obviously a huge focus in the space uh, that's all around, you know, creating uh, an open banking environment where there's more data sharing across big institutions around consumer data, particularly. Um, and we might expect some changes in that space as well. So those are very five sort of very quick areas that we're looking at in terms of direct implications of election on, on FinTech. And like I said, if there's gonna be another four years of the Trump administration, expect more of the same and few of these things in, you know, being reflected and manifesting themselves. But if there's a switch administration, then clearly there might be some changes across these areas. Um, I'll spend another maybe five to six quick minutes and then we'll sort of you know, have a discussion uh, with, with Sarah and Sri on these issues. But one of the things that we look at, we're obviously investment bankers and we've got a uh, big presence on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange is uh, changes happening in the capital markets and a couple of areas where I wanna sort of, you know, piece together what's happening in, in different areas and kind of give you the bigger picture. Overall, the bigger picture here is around, you know, we all get it, more automation, uh, more innovation happening in the entire capital raising companies going public process, right? That's overall the, the big story. And that's nothing new. That's been a long-term sort of focus for the last, you know, four to five years. But if you break up what's happening in the capital market space, here are the four areas and I'll sort of walk you through, let's go, um, you know, clockwise from the top left. On the public listing side, which means companies going public on the New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ, the big story there has been beyond, obviously I'll get to the SPAC issue. But longer term, last 10, 15 years, you might remember that back when Google went public in 2004 uh, through a Dutch auction, which was an alternative to the traditional investment banker led IPO model, uh, which usually charges between three and 5% of the total amount of proceeds of an IPO. Uh, the Dutch auction was an alternative to that model. And for a long time, you know, followers of the investment banking space, you might remember a legendary investment banker called Bill Hambrecht who uh, at Hambrecht and Quest uh, back in 1998 pioneered the concept of the Dutch auction. And there were a couple of companies like Google and Morningstar that went public through the Dutch auction, but by and large after 2004 for the next 15 years, uh, there weren't a lot of companies that went public using the Dutch auction. 
last four or five years, there's been a resurgence in alternative ways for companies to reach the public market uh, without going through a traditional investment banking led IPO roadshow model. And the two big changes there have been recently Spotify and Slack. And we also have Airbnb that is projected uh, to go public in the same way. We also had Palantir uh, that went public through a, through a direct listing. So direct listing basically is a way for a company to go out there and raise capital or, or actually technically not raise capital, but make their private securities be listed on an exchange without actually having to go through a traditional investment banking route. Now today, if you use a direct listing uh, route, the SEC doesn't allow you to raise fresh new capital. You can basically take your current private capital that you have private securities and make them available to public market investors. But the SEC is in the process of re relaxing those restrictions in public listing. And very shortly in the next six to 12 months, we expect if not sooner, that direct listings would allow companies to also raise fresh new capital. Beyond that, very quickly, the SPAC issue is despite whatever you've read last six to eight months, SPACs are nothing new. The idea of a special purpose acquisition company vehicle for companies to go public is not new, but last 12 months, obviously last six months in particular, there's been explosion of SPAC, um, uh, SPACs that have gone public. The common theme there has been uh, a marquee, well-known private equity uh, investor uh, like Bill Ackerman, that basically is using the brand image and uh, the recognition of the private investor to essentially create a private SPV vehicle, list that on the exchange, and then take the proceeds from that and identify a company they want to acquire and take public through that route. Until now, in the, in the financial services space, we haven't had a lot of big companies that have gone public through SPACs. There is talk about Stripe maybe going public, the largest um, fintech privately valued at about $36 billion to maybe go through public, public through a SPAC. So that's a public listing side. Top right-hand side, nothing new happening in that space. That's basically private fundraising. We've obviously seen the crowdfunding platforms that began in 2015-16. Uh, shot in the arm from the Pension Protection Act that allowed firms to raise capital through alternative means. Nothing new there. Uh, we had ICO craze in 2018. Then the securities token offering craze of raising capital in 2019. Both of those have dramatically sort of fallen off the cliff this year, um, in part because the SEC has filed lawsuits against a lot of companies that raise capital through the ICO and STO route. So nothing new there. Uh, moving down uh, bottom right is what's happening in the M&A landscape. That's quite fascinating. And that's something that, you know, we are, we are M&A bankers as well. And what's been happening there has been um, a lot of the large bulge bracket companies like Goldman and JP Morgan, Merrill Lynch, have actually been rolling out their own applications, their own apps in a way, for big corporates to actually understand which of their businesses are underperforming, um, and do that analysis and then be, be better able to engage with bankers and say, I've got this particular divisions underperforming. I want to divest it or I want to acquire something. So basically it's automating the lower end of what traditional M&A bankers did, but handing all those tools to co big corporates so they can do that work themselves and basically automating the lower end of the M&A stack. Bottom left-hand side is a fascinating area. That is the trading of private securities. You might remember 2015, NASDAQ under Bob Greifeld bought a company called Second Markets, Barry Sealbird's company, that today is the largest private market for private securities called the NASDAQ private market. NASDAQ private market allows private companies like Airbnb or Ant Financial to list their private securities to be traded and sold to accredited investors. There's been some relaxation of the accredited investors definition. So average retail investors increasingly being able to buy shares in private companies on these markets. Beyond NASDAQ private market, there are a slew of other providers in that space. I've listed five to watch right now. There are about another three that we don't have on this list. Watch that space very close, closely because that's an area where it allows both retail investors and a wider set of institutional investors to essentially buy private securities. Again, something that was not possible literally about three or four years ago. So across capital markets, bringing it all together, whether it's private fundraising, 
the trading of private securities, unconventional ways for private companies to go public through direct listings, Dutch auctions or SPACs. And then what's happening on the M&A side, there's been major movement around the capital market space. Um, moving into very quickly what's happening in, in this space, in terms of the FinTech space, breaking it up across six different segments. I'll spend about two minutes here overall, and then we'll sort of hand it over and have a conversation around this space. But we've essentially used an income statement framework to look at what the implications are for the COVID situation right now over the last six to eight months on six different sectors within financial services. So the way you, we've kind of looked at challenger banks, for example, is say, let's think about how challenger banks make money, net interest margins, right? Let's think about what the big, big expense structure is. The biggest expense structure for challenger banks has been customer acquisition costs. And over the COVID situation, one thing that happened was investors became a lot more skeptical, a lot more circumspect, a lot more risk adverse and saying, I'm not gonna start keep providing money to challenger banks to go out there and take investor money to go out there and acquire customers. You would have to have an organic way of raising awareness, marketing yourself and acquiring customers. So suddenly, if you look at the expense level on the challenger bank space, they had to look for other ways to go out there and acquire customers. So customer acquisition costs for challenger banks has suddenly have shot up last to six, eight months. Those expenses have directly fallen down to the revenue bottom line and profitability for a lot of the challenger banks has actually suffered. Now, overall, I will say that from where we were back in the spring, when we were expecting um, you know, dire situation for private fintech, it's actually been quite, quite good. Q3 of this year has been one of the record uh, quarters for M&A in the private fintech space. So things have recovered pretty handsomely. But I think I'll tell you as, um, you know, as a second tier investment bank, we sort of play in the mid market space. A lot of the M&A activity and the private fundraising here you see is happening very much focused around late stage companies. There's been investors that are doubling down on late stage companies. You've seen massive increases in valuation for unicorns like Robinhood, Coinbase, take your pick, right? Stripe, um, Chime, Revolut, you know, take Robinhood, for example, in, in December of last year, 2019, Robinhood was $3.5 billion in valuation. In February of this year, they did a round of capital. They were valued at 5.6 billion. Today, they're valued at $14 billion. Right. So massive uptick in valuation. But like I said, across fintech, both fundraising, you know, valuations have been very, very much focused around late stage companies, unicorns, and what is happening on the, on the smaller end. So whether it's seed stage activity or mid markets so or companies that are in the valuation of between 20 and 100 million dollars, though they're actually suffering quite a bit. So across the board, yes, I'm saying as a banker, things are not as bad as they were back in March, April, but it's very much focused around late stage companies. Beyond that, let's just take all the six areas and just you know quickly give you 30 seconds what's happening. Challenger banks, top 10 challenger banks have done extremely well, but there's a major shakeout happening in everyone below the top 10 you know, challenger bank area. Now we obviously hear about the new banks and the revolutes and the chimes and the varos. Uh, the other big story in the challenger bank space that you've, you've probably been watching is, and this is actually a broader theme across fintech, is that a lot of the fintechs till now were focused really around distributing financial products out to the market, particularly in the consumer space. Last six to 12 months, we are actually seeing a lot of the fintechs that are actually going out there and acquiring banking licenses, payment licenses, insurance licenses. So moving upstream, from not just distributing financial product, but taking principal risk. So Revolut, Chime, uh, Vero are three examples of companies, challenger banks, last six to 12 months that have now banking licenses in the US, which means they can take deposits, get um, FDIC insurance and deposits, and actually start competing directly with banks head on. So that's been a big change in the challenger bank space and across the board in financial services. Another example of that trend is happening in insurance very quickly. You had uh, Root that went public last week. We had Lemonade that went public five, six months ago. 
both Root and Lemonade are licensed insurance carriers. They just don't distribute financial product out to the marketplace. They actually are registered licensed insurance carriers. That's a major change compared to the first crop of insurtechs and fintechs that grew over the last six to eight years that did not have banking licenses, didn't want banking licenses. They were essentially only distributing financial product. On the digital lending space, uh, basically the bottom has fallen out there, right? Both in the public market, the digital lending space with firms like OnDeck, that was a darling on Wall Street five years ago. Now, uh, you know, at one point they were valued at about 2.5 billion. Um, as of the summer, they were valued at $90 million and they sold out to a company called Innova. Um, so the digital lending space, big pressure to be expected because uh, in a downturn, economic downturn, foreclosures go up. Um, while interest rates come down, there's still a lot of foreclosures, a lot of defaults, a lot of delinquencies that tends to impact the digital lending space quite significantly. Uh, so that's happened in the digital lending space. Um, it's a very cyclical space to be expected under downturn, digital lending takes the hit on the chin. The robo-advisor space, we had obviously a big, um, big player in this market exit quite early, a company called Motif, you might remember, run by a, a great CEO called Hardeep Valia. They had a tremendous roster of advisors from Arthur Levitt to Sally Krachak. And uh, they just closed shop back in, in April, May, which was, you know, we thought it might be a canary in the coal mine and would show more pressure in the robo-advisory space. But, you know, the robo-advisory space has actually done pretty okay. Uh, but I think a lot of the, you know, massive valuation optics we saw in 2017 to 19, the robo-advisory space have actually ebbed, have sort of slowed down pretty significantly. So we haven't had uh, massive capital raises in the robo-advisory space for quite a while. Capital markets has always been a feast of famine business. And fortunately for firms like our, ours in the public market space, you know, transaction volume has been massive because of volatility. So we've actually benefited from massive transaction volume in the institutional capital market space. Um, beyond that, from a FinTech standpoint, institutional capital markets is a tough area as, 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 as Sarah can attest to for FinTechs to kind of break in high barriers to entry, massive regulatory capital required. Um, you know, you need tremendous amount of scale to participate in that space. So capital markets, institutional capital markets is a lot of activity in the large, large company space, but um, fewer amount of opportunities for fintechs to actually make major inroads in the capital market space. One area that we are seeing capital markets do quite well is uh, companies like DVO1 bringing shedding light to places like the ABS and the MBS market company called Capitalists, which is a venture capital funded company that is trying to improve collateral management. So there are pockets in the capital market space where fintechs are, are doing quite well, but by and large, that's not a space where a lot of the venture capital funded privately held companies are making a big dent. Payments, massive growth in the payment space in around embedded, embed, embedded payments. Um, beyond that, obviously there's been overall because of the lockdown and the COVID situation, transaction volumes in the payment space have come down, but obviously digital payments have gone up a lot. Big, the biggest benefactor of that has obviously been Square. Uh, I'm kicking myself that I didn't buy the Square uh, stock earlier, uh, but that st stock has exploded. Big story there in Square has been, they have moved over the last two, three years beyond the you know, Square Cash and the Square Dongle that we all remember them from four or five years ago, Square actually applied for a banking license, got that in, in March, April, and they've got the Square Bank with a banking license. They're providing Square Lending, Square Cash, essentially using the Square platform and the knowledge they have around merchants in the platform and now offering lending products and credit products just like a traditional bank is with better amount of insight on cash flows for all the merchants that are on the Square platform. So big story in, in, in payments is Square, and then increasingly the embedding of payments in non-financial companies and the provision of payments through vertically oriented software companies. That's a trend that we're seeing across the board and everybody is investing in that area. In insurance on the last part, uh, like I said, the big story there is a lot of the FinTech companies like Levinade, Root and others, Hippo, that are increasingly becoming insurance carriers of the 10, FinTech companies that went public in the US, six have been insurance companies. 
So there's been um, and um, larger number of insure techs than in the last couple of years that are going public. So very quickly, that's kind of what you know what we're seeing across across six areas. Happy to delve deeper into any of these areas in a Q and A or the discussion with Sri and Sarah. So Sri, let me hand it over back to you, and uh, you know spend the next twenty minutes in in having a discussion around these areas. So let me stop sharing my screen. Be back here. Awesome. This was this was awesome. Uh, B, you know, I can't believe we just had like thirty minutes, and it was probably like six hours worth of lecture packed in like thirty minutes. So thank you for thank you for providing your insights. I know it takes quite a bit of time to kind of keep your ear to the to the ground and hear about all the things which are happening. Um, so uh, when you take, uh, I'll let you take a quick break before I can ask you some questions. Uh, so Sarah, I just wanted to start off this conversation by um, you know uh, asking about some of the the fintech innovations which are happening in the Massachusetts area. I know you were uh, involved with uh, a recent report uh, by the ENY about like the fintech ecosystem in Massachusetts, and uh, there was also a summary version of which which I saw which said like you know fintech is at the crossroads. So I wanted to see if you had any specific thoughts about you know, where the industries are going, what kind of digital trails you're seeing in terms of the success stories and also uh, the ones which are trying to be successful. And how do you see the ecosystem acknowledging all these things and, you know, fortifying the whole aspect? Yeah, Shree, thank you. And, and D, I agree uh, with Shree. What a tremendous amount of information you just shared with us. Um, on trends and also the extrapolation out of, of forecasting in a period of crisis uh, that we find ourselves. And um, Shree, let me address the, uh, the report on the Massachusetts FinTech um, community and then kind of lift it up to a more global perspective that I hope Dee you'll engage in because I do think that we have, as you opened up your comment, Shree, benefited from a number of individuals in the local community um, in, in Massachusetts, yourself being one, D, as you were at MIT and otherwise, to help us really build this robust collegial environment where entrepreneurs are lift, fintech entrepreneurs are lifted up, where you have this desire to create intersections, uh, not only with, with customers, but with investors and with thought leaders, uh, D and Shri, I count you all, um, in that category, which helps our local entrepreneurial community uh, pivot. And one of the areas that, Dee, I was so struck by as you were saying it, um, is that the influence that the pandemic has had on payments in particular and the winners like a square. Um, and I couldn't help but intersect that in my mind because we too have this very thriving payments um, community, <coughs> excuse me. I don't have COVID, by the way. I just swallowed too bad. <laughs> but uh, you know this intersection of payment entrepreneurs. We have a couple unicorns sitting in Boston um, with the um, with the increase in, if you will, underserved individuals who are decrease, I guess, in the individuals who are underserved. You mentioned a 300 basis point improvement um, of individuals who have historically not been served by the banks, and um, as reported by the FDIC. And what I'm seeing is, and I think the numbers play it out in the entrepreneurial community is such a rapid increase. Um, just as people are being banked, turning away from the banks, if you will, as a, as a peer, as a payment vehicle and using those systems. And to your point, using Square or perhaps more increasingly Venmo, maybe PayPal to create these peer to peer payment environments. And I'm just really, for myself, I think it's a very curious moment in time. And perhaps um, you have some thoughts on where the entrepreneurs in the payment space, which is one of those great areas in the Massachusetts communities, might find themselves with the next opportunity. Um, do we see this continuation post pandemic of digital payments, of moving away from traditional banking providers to actually enabling that exchange and flow of funds um, it's one question I think that I have outstanding of a number that came to me as you were talking, but Shri, you're the moderator. <laughs> well, I, I'd love to just think, you know, sit back yeah. and listen to you guys. Uh, I and mean, I'm just making notes so that I can teach my students when I go back to my classroom. But isn't it a, one, <laughs> it's a wonderful intersection? And then if there's a tertiary 
and perhaps non-secular trend, but something that we're observing, of course, is the, is the really incredible contraction in consumer spending. So we're taking money off the table. We all can probably think about the implications for fintech and entrepreneurs in an environment where payments are changing rapidly, how we conduct them, what it means when there's less spending in the marketplace. I think you mentioned that, D. What it eventually means to the downstream implication of how we innovate around lending and credit. And then, of course, I, the big white whale for me, and D, the comment you made is, are we as a as an entrepreneurial community disintermediating capital markets from the back door? Mm. So I think there's three big themes there for us to unpack, Shri, as we talk about the implications of COVID on fintech. If I picked up on what Dee shared with us, yeah, no, I, I think so. Great, great points that you know. Again, it's it's we see a dichotomy, you know, or, or a tale of two cities in every part of the industry. If you look at the stock market, you look at the S&P 500. I mean, you talk about you know, the stock market's reaction right now, the start of our, our conversation today. We don't know who's the president and the market's up 750 points. I mean, try to figure that one out, right? But right. contrast that with how the average company, the Russell 2000 is doing. We know that story, right? I live in Winchester, stock market's doing great. You do go down the street, two dry cleaners have closed. I had a shoe repair guy. I stopped by there and says, I've just started opening up my shop now one day a week. So the contrast between how big companies are doing and the mom and pop businesses on the street are doing, there's a massive you know, distinction there. And I think that is reflected to some extent in the fintech space that the large unicorns, right? The large Robin Hoods, like I said, are still doing well, but I, I can see it every day in the calls that we get from the smaller fintech companies looking for capital. We all hear in the Wall Street Journal or Bloomberg or whatever, or CB Insights, the big capital raises. But if you look at the breadth of companies that are raising capital, it is definitely a much tougher environment for, the raise, to, for them to raise capital. And we can see that because we get more calls from those companies now asking our help to raise capital where six to eight months ago, there were five VCs falling over themselves to invest in that company. So I think that that's, that's one point. Now we are, you know, we're not economists, so we haven't sort of figured that one out that how contraction in the consumer economy is gonna impact the fintechs downstream, but we can see some, some reflection of that. I think the other thing is, and this was actually predates COVID, while the first wave of fintech growth of the last six to eight years was very much focused around consumer oriented models, as, as you know, Sarah, I'm sure you've seen it yourself in your experience, there's been a lot of focus around the B2B space, right? So more business to business oriented uh, fintech opportunities, there's been a major amount of growth in that space that might continue to actually or accelerate. Uh, and we're seeing a lot of the investors, the big VCs are switching in that direction anyway, coming out of the COVID situation that we expect, even though consumer credit might come back, consumer spending might come back, it's not going to be where it was in February of 2020 for another two years. And therefore, if you're an investor trying to put fresh capital to work, I think they are more hesitant in putting it to more B2C oriented companies and more B2B oriented companies. So those are sort of, you know, a couple of quick points. Um, on, the, on the payment space, very quickly, I would say that, um, you know, again, it's a mixed, mixed bag. If you look at the overall amount of transaction volume through uh, the big networks, right? Whether it's MasterCard and Visa, they are down almost about 22%, even after resurgence after Labor Day. So, you know, summer was 40 to 50% below the same time last year. After Labor Day, we had a big uptick, the market opened, consumer sentiment increased, there was more spending happening, some travel improved, uh, but we are still about 18 to 20% below for the large networks, Visa, Pay, you know, MasterCard and all those guys. Um, Having said that, to your point, PayPal, Venmo, all the unconventional, if I can call them unconventional, ways of um, sending you know, payments, money remittances and all of that, that's been actually doing quite well. Having said that, you listeners probably saw that yesterday, Zelle, the big you know, consortium, um, announced the record growth, right? So the big banks are fighting back. 
And I think the gap between the traditional incumbent institution and the fintech company, if it was 10 percentage points 24 months ago, um, I think it's about seven percentage points now, right? And I think some of the tougher economic environment for everyone, uh, to some extent might actually end up hurting the fintechs a little bit more and might actually position the large banks, big institutions to actually gain a couple of points over the fintech companies. I was actually as a banker expecting more amount of um, you know, acquisitions being led by big institutions of fintech companies that are opportunistically picking up assets, um, you know, but hasn't happened until now. Maybe it'll happen in the next six to 12 months. So I think the payment space, it's again, a mixed picture there. Um, reduction of overall amount of transaction volume, more transaction volume going towards digital upstarts like the PayPal and the Venmo guys, but contrast that a little bit with the resurgence of activity in people like, you know, consortiums like Zelle that have actually picked up a lot compared to where things were about two, three years ago, where there was a wide gap between sending money through a Bank of America account versus what you could do with PayPal. So let's just kind of delve a little bit deeper into the whole spending um, aspect, right? So, I mean, um, consumer spending has significantly gone down, especially when it comes down to like the mom and pop examples we're kind of talking about, you know, the foot traffic into the retail establishments um, and uh, how people are actually saving more. I mean, we have had like record savings. Everybody's talking about, well, my saving rate has gone up so much considering all the you know, opportunities I'm missing, deliberately missing, right? Um, on how does that kind of, you know, from a driver perspective, if you're considering spending as a driver for many of these fintechs because they're transaction oriented, the transaction volume fuels the growth of customer acquisition and kind of fueling that whole machinery, right? Uh, but on the other hand, on the enterprise side of things, uh, just because we have to now think about moving to the cloud, there has been significant spending in terms of infrastructure and also technology related spending to move assets to the cloud, moving data and uh, you know, compute assets to the cloud. And that's why we're seeing record numbers and you know, the, the cloud renders and you know, all the spending which is going on there. Um, how do you kind of see you know, the, the FinTech ecosystem play out? You know, are more and more startups gonna be focusing more on catering towards like the larger, the incumbents as you call them and saying like, here are some products which could potentially help your ecosystem. Or do you think once the spending starts coming back as we, as we post COVID see the things come back, we're gonna see a resurgence in business models or picking up off some of the, you know, the toast of the world, if you will, you know, which had to basically, you know, shut down half their operations because and no one was going to a restaurant. And now things are coming back. So will the expansion start happening there? Um, I mean, I think if you look at sort of consumer spending, uh, first of all, I mean, just for a, it, it doesn't, you don't have to be super smart to understand that in our economy that depends, you know, 70, 72% of consumer spending, if consumer spending is down 25% compared to last year, obviously it's going to impact you know, the economic situation at some point, right? Beyond that, I think you can't really tease out, it's, you know, consumer spending is kind of at a, at a more macro level, right? And you're talking about the FinTech implications at this level. So I think any implication on FinTech is kind of two levels below, it's a very indirect kind of impact. In terms of, you know, one area where you might see an impact is, um, Shidi, your question that is that gonna push people push a lot of the fintechs away from the consumer space. That was anyway happening, as I said, in the last couple of years, right? It was a natural evolution that a lot of the fintech companies and a lot of the venture capital money uh, was focused on the consumer market, mm -hmm. right? And particularly in retail banking, in, in payments, in robot advice. Anyway, even before COVID taking that out, we were moving in the direction of more B2B oriented you know, investments. And I think that might continue to sort of accelerate that, that trend. Um, I don't think the market's big enough to accommodate. You know, I think I remember in January of this year, we did some analysis for all challenger banks that had more than a million accounts. Mm -hmm. And there are about 28, 30 challenger banks around the world that had more than a million accounts. And uh, now there are barely about 12, right? So I think there's been a contraction 
uh, sorting out, you know, the fringe players across fintech have actually uh, are not doing all that great, uh, which I think might be, you know, good for the market overall for the fintech marketplace because you don't need, you know, a hundred challenger banks. You might need ten or fifteen really good ones. I mean, take your pick in every every part of financial services or fintech and insurtech ecosystem. There've been a lot of marginal players that have gotten funded, and that net net is bad overall for the market, right? You don't want, you know, substandard companies to be funded. So I think some of that shakeout uh, is beginning to happen because of COVID, but the movement away from consumer oriented FinTech models to B2B oriented models was I would say actually already happening and probably gets accelerated with the COVID situation. Yes. So, Sorry, are you kind of seeing similar things, uh, you know, in the, in the startups which are kind of approaching the sandbox and other, you know, your, uh, your uh, kind of, uh, how, how are things progressing? in terms of people seeking money or seeking business models or thinking about the ecosystem. Yeah, Shri, I wanted to pick up on something, a really important secular trend that you just slipped in there um, in the question of consumer spending. And that was the acceleration of the institutions moving to the cloud mm -hmm. and the, you, the movement of data. And frankly, um, I mean, you said assets. I, I, I thought data, right? Just with our work in the FinTech sandbox. Um, but critically important systems are rapidly being digitized. Um, where we had previously seen a hurdle. I mean, I started my last company in the wake of the credit crisis. Um, as, as Dee referenced, it was a capital markets um, bond investment platform, bond investor platform. And, um, and I thought at the moment then, and I just couldn't reflect um, with what you just said, Shri, now, never let a good crisis go to waste. Mm -hmm. And I don't want anyone to think that I'm sounding crass or not reflective of the pain that um, many of us have gone through through this current pandemic. But the reality is, is that we have seen a push towards digitization that otherwise may not have been catalyzed as quickly. And so what I in, what I see both in terms of investing today in the, in the entrepreneurs and the fintechs, supporting them through the fintech sandbox, working in the community, is that we are at a pivotal moment where we actually do have the opportunity to, to utilize this new intersection of institutional investment in the cloud, mm -hmm. in new environments to actually ad advance the adoption of innovation. And sure, you and I ought to talk about this in three years, better serve the consumer on the street, better serve the small business, because we now have that important intersection of technology, um, long reach, but also the mm -hmm. emergence of new models and data that lets us make better decisions in the absence of right now, to be honest, What's a credit model going to look like for that dry cleaner, D, that you just talked about, right? We have to develop and we have to create new sets of observations that let us more intelligently lend based on a period that's unprecedented in any other time. And so I think we're at this really unique moment. If you're a fintech entrepreneur, and now is your time. You have to ask yourself the question, what will I do with this time? And that's what I just took away. I mean, I'm forever the optimist, right? <laughs> but in all, in all honesty, it is, a, it is a really great moment to be a FinTech entrepreneur Absolutely. and to think about solving some very seemingly intractable problems. And D, your point is well made though. Does the capital flow to those individuals who are uniquely positioned to solve it or is it flowing, as you've just correctly said, to smaller, num larger deal sizes, but smaller numbers of entrepreneurs? And that, to me, is probably the question that needs to be asked. Yeah. There's many questions, but that's just one of them. And so how do we see the redistribution of capital against really good ideas in a period of uncertainty? Um, but I think I danced away from your question, Shri, to pick up on. But, but I, think that, that I thought it was really important. important that intersects with what Dee has taught us today and what you asked. Absolutely. So I, I have another question, which is coming from the chat window. So, uh, so Rod asks, like traditionally B2B opportunities have been a hard slog for large institutions preferring to do their own thing instead of leveraging or partnering or buying FinTech startups. Is that where the action will be for the next two years or are there specific areas that should be focus areas for fintech startups on the consumer space is there a way to do good and still be able to grow into a large fintech company 
very thoughtful questions. Uh, I'll take both of you, uh, you know, both of you, what do you think about it? Sarah, why, why don't you take a crack at it first? Well, Dee, since it was asked by one of our dear friends, <laughs> Rod's Raw, I feel, I feel like we're talking to it directly over, over coffee. It, it just removed all this virtual stuff we're in. So Rod, thank you for that question. Um, I think we learned, um, Shri, to go back to just your pointed question about the study of FinTech, the, the working group of institutions, investors, entrepreneurs, and academics have come together um, with EY to produce in Massachusetts, is that we see that this emergence of this shift, it's, it's been five years in the making, but of institutions opening their doors and, and seeking now a different type of partnership. And so I think the old, the old way that we fought so hard against, right? We fought the old for a long time, which is to get into the institution. I think now the new, the new paradigm and certainly moving forward is an easier transition moment with the, with the institutions. Um, and I don't have any other proof, but the sense that I'm sitting at the table with the largest financial institutions in the Boston area right now, thinking about those thoughts and how do we improve it? But I'll go back to that question I asked D because it actually excited me. Um, are we tackling these institutional challenges by disintermediating um, in the form of direct listings, in the forms of SPACs, in the adoption of new and different ways to fractionalize securities? So you know, you're no longer seeing this closed loop environment in the capital markets. That change is being pioneered by the innovators. It's not the institutions who are opening their doors. And it might be, Shri, your question might be best asked, answered now by you, Dee. Are we at that moment when the institutions actually are cooperative, but we also maybe see a, dis a displacement, but not in the negative, but in the positive, because it makes the capital markets more, more accessible. Yeah. No, absolutely, Sarah. And uh, Shri, I'm going to answer that very quickly. And uh, I've got to run because I've got something at one o'clock. I'm sorry. Uh, but, but Rod, thank you for your question. Um, I mean, that's, you know, nothing new there, right? I mean, trying to move anything to the B2B space has traditionally been a longer process. And that's the reason why a lot of the early investors were hesitant in putting money to work in the B2B space. A lot of entrepreneurs were more keen to uh, start uh, you know, start business in the BTC market because it's much easier to acquire customers in that space. So there's nothing new there. I think I will say that big institutions are a little bit more open to seeking help from, you know, fintech companies on conventional places to actually address problems. Uh, we're seeing that happening in corporate banking. We're seeing that happening in parts, like I said, in the capital market space, collateral management. Um, so there are pockets of the area where, pockets of the, of the financial services industry where B2B models are, Big institutions are a little bit more open to looking for smaller way, smaller companies to actually provide ways that they can tackle issues in the capital market space for the trading of private securities, for example, right? NASDAQ private markets, like I said, began trading private securities, but the other six players that I had on my chart are all small venture capital funded fintech companies like Equidesign and Adipar, which has been around for a while, but they're all basically, like I said, 50, 75, 100 person companies that are trying to tackle a major issue, which is bringing liquidity to private securities. So I think there is you know, no silver bullet, no big change necessarily. It's been overall more accommodative environment for B2B opportunities and FinTech companies to play a role there. Uh, nothing major is gonna change overnight in that area, but I think overall it tends to be moving the right direction. So, yeah, thank you. On that note, I think uh, we should start wrapping up. And thank you so much again, Dee and Sarah, for spending your afternoon with us and educating our audience uh, with your uh, amazing research and thoughts. I just want to add one thing, which I tell my students. You know, when we talk about like a smooth flowing process and we think about optimizing this process, you always think of where are these inefficiencies and can address this. And, Three years ago, when I started teaching fintech, that was where the focus was. You know, saying so you, know, you have these rigid pipelines, and the fintechs would come in and say, "You know what? I see inefficiency there. How do I grab there that opportunity and then kind of create something new?" Um, I'm kind of seeing COVID as a forest fire uh, because it hasn't left anybody untouched. That's kind of basically taken everybody to another 
level and you have to start thinking from scratch about like what would evolve you know where are those green shoots which are going to come up and evolve from there uh, rather than just kind of looking at these you know minuscule opportunities for process improvements or you know, things which people have been doing forever but looking for opportunities um, i would love to continue this conversation but unfortunately we'll have to wrap up i'd love to have you back on this forum another time probably in the next few months in time and then we'll continue the conversation there. And viewers, uh, thank you for joining us again. And next week, we're gonna talk about a different topic on ethics in AI in financial markets. And this time we will have someone from Singapore who's gonna be talking about the ecosystem in the Southeast Asia. And they've been doing a lot of uh, innovative aspects in the FinTech area. We didn't really get a chance to go global in the discussion today, but we'll hear about from Dan Libu, who is the author of the book, AI, the AI book and talk about what's the ecosystem looking like there in Singapore and how does uh, the pandemic and other associated activities kind of turning the whole system there. And we'll continue the discussion next week. Thank you again, and I'll see you in the next week. Thanks again, Sarah. Thank you, thank you Sarah. It was a pleasure. Thank you, bye-bye.